Hello and welcome to part one of the Biology 6 Cardiovascular System Lecture. Now, I want to give you a heads up about something. Up until this point in the semester, I've been making these video lecture recordings uh, just on my own at my house, recording them uh, just for this online class. But just this week, something struck me that I actually have these lectures already recorded. I delivered these lectures in a previous semester, and I made recordings of them. And so, uh, partially just to save time for myself, I'm now going to start mixing in some of these lectures that I did previously instead of creating new lectures for you. Um, and you, so the, the, the lectures that you see from here on in in the semester might sound slightly different because I'm speaking to a live audience. This, is, this was an actual face-to-face -face class where I was giving these, these lectures. Um, yeah, so occasionally you might hear me asking questions to the audience. So that, that might sound a little bit different uh, than the lectures that you've heard up to this point. But other than that, they should be uh, pretty much exactly the same. And as a matter of fact, I feel that I speak a little bit more fluidly when I'm giving a live lecture than when I'm recording these just here in my house. Uh, so hopefully you'll en enjoy the change um, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the sort of the style of the presentation. Um, but that being said, occasionally I've wanted to make some edits in these pre-recorded lectures. So every now and then you'll see the, uh, the, the sound of my voice kind of jump back to the, the sound that you're hearing right now, sort of the in-studio recording sound. Okay, with that being said, let's jump into part one of the cardiovascular system lecture. Okay, so yes, we're kind of exciting. We're beginning a new lecture topic today, the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system has three major parts. Your cardiovascular system includes the blood, the heart, and the blood vessels. And working together, they carry out the major function of your cardiovascular system, which is transportation of substances within your body, moving substances throughout the body. Um, what sort of substances are we talking about? Well, lots of different things that are important to the survival of all your tissues and organs. Things like oxygen, nutrients, and water are, are good examples of the types of thing that your, your cardiovascular system transports th throughout your body, distributes throughout your body. And yeah, and obviously those are very important things for the su survival of all your cells and tissues and organs. Um, okay, so here's the way that they work together to to distribute all these substances throughout your body. The, the substances are dissolved in the blood, so like oxygen and nutrients and water and wastes and hormones, all these things that have to be transported are dissolved in the blood. But if the blood didn't circulate, then your body would not be able to, to transport those substances throughout the body. And so, yeah, something has to circulate your blood, and that's where the heart and the blood vessels come in. The heart's job is to be the pump for the blood, you know, to make it circulate. And the blood vessel's job is to carry the blood throughout the body to, to all your tissues and organs. Now, so obviously the blood is, very, is you know, a very important tissue in this whole process since it, it carries the dissolved substances. But in this chapter on the cardiovascular system, we're not going to talk too much about the blood. Uh, why not? Well, the blood's going to get its own chapter. As soon as we finish the cardiovascular system, we'll do an entire chapter just on the blood. But this chapter, we are going to focus a lot on the, on the heart and the blood vessels. So let's uh, begin with the heart. Um, heart function, start off by saying that the heart pumps the blood. And so if I think that, that really encapsulates the, the major job of the heart. It is the pump to make the blood circulate. And I brought my little squeeze bubble bottle here to give a, a demonstration of the basic principle how the heart operates. So I, I put water in here. Yeah, so, so this represents the heart. The, the, the heart is a hollow organ. There are hollow chambers inside, and the chambers fill up with blood. And so the, the water in here represents the blood inside the heart. The walls of the heart are made out of cardiac muscle tissue, which are what my hands represent. Well, I think you can appreciate if I, when I squeeze, you know, when the cardiac muscle in the heart contracts, it pressurizes the blood, 
And when you pressurize a liquid, you make it squirt out of its container. And so that's the way the heart pumps the blood. The cardiac muscle squeezes on the blood that's in the chambers inside the heart, and that pumps the blood out of the heart. Lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. That's, that's the basic idea of how the heart pumps the blood. But, of course, you know, it's a little bit more detailed than just that, so let's now dissect it a little bit more. Um, the blood flow of the heart always occurs in loops. And what I mean by that is the blood is always pumped out of the heart to each organ and then back to the heart again. You know, it's a loop. Heart, out, blood goes out to the organ and then back to the heart. Um, and there, there are two major loops uh, of, 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 that your heart pumps blood into. One is called the pulmonary loop and the other is called the systemic loop. And so let's, let's start off looking at the pulmonary loop. But again, so you don't lose the big picture, all blood flow is always away from the heart to some organ and then back to the, from that organ to the heart. We call, that, we call those loops of the, of, of the blood flow. And there are two, pulmonary loop and systemic loop. Okay, here's my little cartoon of the pulmonary loop. The stripy lines are blood vessels. The beating thing is the heart. You can see some little hollow chambers inside the heart there, and the arrow shows the direction of blood flow. So the pulmonary loop is the loop that goes away from the heart, you know, it carries the blood out of the heart to the lungs and then back to the heart again. That is the pulmonary loop. There we go. Now, don't be afraid to be obvious. What do you think the blood is being pumped to the lungs for? Oxygen, right. Uh, and so, you know, the blood needs to pick up oxygen so it can deliver that oxygen to all the cells and tissues throughout the body. And so that's, that's why you have a pulmonary loop, so the blood can flow to the lungs and pick up oxygen. Now, there's another gas that the blood carries called carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide is a waste molecule. Waste are things that the body wants to get rid of. Uh, and so when the blood flows to the lungs, the blood is not only picking up oxygen, the blood is getting rid of the carbon dioxide gas into the blood. And what happens to it after it goes into the lungs? You breathe it out. <sighs> That's one of the reasons why you breathe out is to just get rid of the CO2 gas that is in the lungs. And of course, that came out, just came out of the blood there. Anyway, uh, yeah, pulmonary loop from the heart to the lungs and back. And the main job is for the blood to pick up oxygen as well as get rid of CO2 gas. Notice there's a color change there. When I showed the blood that's flowing away from the lungs, I used a red color there, and that's, that's for real, so to speak. Uh, blood that is rich in oxygen, blood that's carrying a lot of oxygen, is bright red colored. Whereas blood that's low in oxygen is a darker color, kind of like a, it's usually shown as, as blue. Um, yeah, so in this diagram, and in any diagrams, in all the diagrams that you're gonna see in this cardiovascular system, any blood vessels that are blue colored, you should think that's gonna be low oxygen blood. And any blood vessels that are red colored, that means that that blood is high in oxygen. And so, you know, it sort of makes sense. The blood that's going to the lungs, that's the low oxygen blood, it's blue colored. And the blood that comes out of the lungs is the high oxygen blood, it's red colored. Okay, don't worry, about the, don't worry about the smaller loop. I'll come to that in, in just a second. So the other loop is called the systemic loop. And again, you know, it, these loops mean from the heart to the various organs, then back to the heart. The systemic loop is the loop that has the blood from the heart to all the organs of the body except the lungs and then back to the heart. Uh, you know, the word systemic means everything, you know, and so yeah, it's pretty much all the organs in your body other than the lungs are part of your systemic loop. So the blood flow from the heart to your brain and then back to the heart, that's part of your systemic loop. And the blood flow from your heart back to your bicep muscle, then back to the heart, that's part of the systemic loop. And the blood flow from your heart to your stomach and then back to the heart, that's part of the systemic loop also. Every organ in your body other than the lungs is part of your systemic loop. Now, you have lots of organs in your body. I mean, we have 
over 100 bones, and those are considered separate organs, and you have over 600 muscles, which are considered separate organs, and you have your stomach and your liver and your brain and your kidneys. And so I guess I don't know exactly how many organs we have in the human body if you added them all up, but it would probably be in the neighborhood of 1,000 organs. And obviously, I can't fit 1,000 organs in this diagram. And so I'm just going to show four organs. Those, those little yellowy things represent the, the 1,000 or so different organs in the body. All right. Um, yeah, and so all those organs and the blood vessels going to those, from the heart to those organs and then back to the heart are part of a systemic loop. And in this diagram I'm showing you, the two organs that I'm showing above the heart will represent all the organs that are above your heart, you know, your, your brain and all the muscles in your face and all the bones that are part of your skull and the bones of your shoulders and the bones of your arms and forearms and hands and things like that. Uh, yeah, so think of these two as always representing all your organs that are above the heart and think of these bottom two as representing all the organs that are below the heart, your stomach, your small intestine, your large intestine, your kidney, your liver, your pancreas, your gallbladder, all the muscles in your hips, all the muscles in your thighs, all the muscles in your legs and feet. Uh, those are going to be represented by these two organs down at the bottom there. Okay, um, well, so remember that when the blood flowed through the pulmonary loop that you see in the stripy red blood vessels here, the, the blood picked up oxygen from the lungs and then that oxygen-rich blood goes back to the heart. And then the heart pumps that oxygen-rich blood into the systemic loop, which is you know, why these blood vessels are red. But notice this, when, when that blood in the systemic loop flows through an organ, the blood that comes out is blue. Why? Because it gave the oxygen to the cells of that organ. You know, organs are made out of tissues, and tissues are made out of cells, and cells need oxygen to stay alive. And so that's the whole point of the systemic loop, is to deliver oxygen to the cells of the tissues of the organs so that the cells can get that oxygen to stay alive. And you know, the cells, when the cells take in the oxygen from that blood in the systemic loop, the cells dump into the blood that waste gas, the carbon dioxide. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, as the blood flows through each organ, not only is the blood giving oxygen to the cells of that organ, the blood is taking away the carbon dioxide um, that those cells are producing. OK, um, so there's the systemic loop and the pulmonary loop. In regards to which one's bigger, I think it's, you can guess the systemic loop is much bigger than the pulmonary loop. The pulmonary loop only has to go from the heart to the lungs and back. And the heart and the lungs are together. They're right next to each other in your thoracic cavity. So that's just not a very big loop. But the systemic loop has to go from the heart throughout your, pretty much your entire body. You know, it goes to all the organs and then back. And so the systemic loop is pretty much the, the size of your body. OK, well, um, we're going to now focus our attention a little bit more on the blood vessels. We're going to come back to the heart here in just a minute. But for a moment, I want to uh, talk about the blood vessels. There are three types of blood vessels. They're called arteries and veins and capillaries. And I know that at this part of your handout, it only talks about the arteries and veins. But we'll talk about the capillaries a little bit later on in the handout. Um, anyway, so arteries, veins, and capillaries are the three types of blood vessels. And let me just say what the difference between an artery and vein is. It's which direction the blood is flowing. Um, all blood vessels that are carrying blood away from the heart are arteries, and all blood vessels that are carrying blood back towards the heart are veins. That's just the definition of artery and vein. Yeah, so if it's, if it's a vessel that's carrying blood out of the heart towards an organ, it's an artery, and if it's a blood vessel that's coming back from the organ towards the heart, it's a vein. Here's how you can help remember that. Uh, the word away begins with an A and ends with a Y. And so the blood vessels that are coming away from the heart are the arteries. And I guess the vein doesn't really have anything like returning or coming back. But just remember, the arteries uh, are like the away blood vessels, and the veins are the opposite. They're the coming back blood vessels. 
Now, uh, there are thousands of different blood vessels in the body, and each blood vessel has its own particular name. I'm only going to want you to know the names of the blood vessels that connect directly to the heart. And so let's look at those ones that connect directly to the heart. Uh, let's see, here we go. Um, so let's begin right here. This, this is the start of the pulmonary loop right here. So the blood vessels that come out of the heart to begin the pulmonary loop are called the pulmonary arteries. And I guess the name kind of makes sense. They're certainly arteries because they're carrying blood away from the heart and they are the arteries of the pulmonary loop. Um, and so they are the pulmonary arteries. And now that I've said that, uh, here we go, the pulmonary arteries, let me make a liar out of myself having just said that. Technically, the first vessel that comes right out of the heart is called the pulmonary trunk. But almost as soon as the pulmonary trunk comes out of the heart, it divides into the pulmonary arteries. And so it's, you can either say the first artery coming out of the heart is the pulmonary trunk, or you can say it's the pulmonary arteries. It's, it's almost, almost means the same thing. All right, um, the, these are veins right here coming back from the lungs, right? Because they're carrying blood back from the organ to the, to, the, to the heart. Those are called the pulmonary veins. And you can see they're returning to the heart right there. All right, and now look at this red, big red blood vessel right there. That comes right out of the heart to begin the systemic loop. That is called the aorta. It's the first artery of the uh, systemic loop. And incidentally, the aorta is the largest blood vessel of the body, which kind of makes sense because remember the, a, the systemic loop is this really big loop and contains pretty much all the organs of your, of your body except for your lungs. And so it's gonna take a lot of blood flow to begin the systemic loop. That's why, they, that's why the aorta is so large. And lastly, there are these blood vessels that are returning blood to the heart from the systemic loop, the blood vessel here and right here. So there's, those are veins, obviously, because they're bringing blood back to the heart. Um, one of those veins that's coming back from into the, to the heart from the systemic loop is called the superior vena cava. That's the vein that carries blood back from the systemic loop from the upper organs, the organs that are above the heart. And that vein below it right there is called the inferior vena cava. That's the vein that carries the blood back from the systemic loop but from the, the, the lower organs of the systemic loop, the organs that are below the heart. Awesome, yeah, so yeah. I do want you to know the vessels that connect to the heart the blood vessel looks back to the heart. At the very beginning of the pulmonary loop, we have, you can either say pulmonary arteries or the pulmonary trunk. I'll accept either answer. The, so those are arteries. And the artery that begins the systemic loop is the aorta. The veins at the end of the pulmonary loop where they come back to the heart are the pulmonary veins. And there's two big veins at the ends of the systemic loop, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Those connect to the heart at the end of the systemic loop. All right, good stuff. Well, uh, so those are the blood vessels that connect to the heart. We're now gonna zoom in on the heart and talk a little bit more about its anatomy. So first of all, where's the heart located? Well, it's located in pretty much the center of your thoracic cavity. Um, and there's this bone here called the sternum, uh, the breastbone. Um, it's basically a shield for the heart. So your heart is pretty much right there below your sternum bone. Your heart is a, roughly the size of your fist. Um, at least in, in, in human beings, the heart is roughly the size of a fist. The, just a, kind of an interesting little trivia bit here, the, the largest animal on the earth is the blue whale, and its heart is apparently about the size of a car, which I think would be an amazing thing to see in real life. Uh, imagine a heart, a heart that big. Uh, but human heart, yeah, about the size of a fist. All right, so uh, remember that the heart is this hollow or organ, and the, the chambers in the heart fill with blood, and the pumping action works like this. The cardiac muscle squeezes and makes pumps the blood, makes the blood shoot out of the heart. We're now going to look at the heart in a little bit more detail. 
Okay, so the, the walls of the heart are made out of cardiac muscle tissue, which is sometimes called myo, myocardial tissue. And the heart actually has four hollow chambers inside, four hollow chambers that, that, that fill up with blood. Okay, but what I really want to emphasize here are, are these hollow chambers inside the heart. Uh, so yeah, there are four hollow chambers inside the heart. Let's see if I have the picture here. No, I don't. Okay, just one second, let me go back. Here we go. Um, at the very top of the heart are two kind of round chambers. These are called the atria. This one here is called the right atrium, and this one here is called the left atrium. Now you may say, wait a minute, Mr. Edens, you're mixing up left and right, but I'm not. Whenever you're talking about body parts, you do them from the patient's perspective. And so, you know, looking over here, if, if that was my heart and I'm facing you, that is my right side, even though it looks like it's on your left side because you're reversed from me. So that's the right atrium, and that's the left atrium right there. Uh, the atria are the receiving chambers of the heart. If you look at this diagram, you can see the right atrium is receiving blood from the end of the systemic loop, you know, from the superior and inferior vena cava. And the left atrium is receiving blood from the pulmonary loop, you know, the, uh, the, the, the pulmonary veins. Good, so atria are small round chambers at the top of the heart, and their job is, or at least one of their jobs, is to receive the blood that's returning to the heart. But, so those are two of the heart's four chambers. If we go down towards the lower part of the heart, you can see there are two kind of V-shaped chambers. Those are called the ventricles. This one here is the right ventricle, and this one here is the left ventricle. Um, so the ventricles are the pumping chambers of the heart in, in the sense that their job is to, is to shoot the blood out of the heart. Uh, you know, so when I, when I was doing my heart demonstration here, when I squeezed, I was pumping the blood out of the heart. Well, that's, that's, that's what the ventricles do. I was being the ventricles when I'm going like that. I'm pumping blood out of the heart. Yeah, so the, the ventricles expel the blood out of the heart. They are larger and more muscular than the atria because they've got a bigger job to do. The, uh, you know, the atria just receive the blood. Well, I'll, I'll, I was going to mention something else. The atria, in addition to receiving blood, the atria then contract and squirt blood down into the ventricles. But that's not a very far distance, right? You know, that's still inside the heart. That's just a few inches. So the, the atria don't have to be very muscular. They only have to move the blood a few inches. But the ventricles have to pump the blood throughout the entire body because the ventricles pump the blood like for, to the lungs and back and well, to all the organs and back in the systemic loop. So the ventricles have to be the, a lot larger, more muscular than the atria are. Okay, um, yeah, so the, the order of events is like this. The atria, the receiving chamber, chambers, fill up with blood returning from the loops. You know, right atrium gets filled with blood returning from the systemic loop, and left atrium gets filled with blood returning from the uh, pulmonary loop. And then in sync with each other, in other words, at the, at the same time, the left and right atria contract and their job is to now squirt that blood into the ventricles. So the atria fill up the ventricles. And you can kind of see that on the diagram right here. They have these little arrows going down. So the right atrium fills up the right ventricle, and the left atrium fills up the left ventricle you know, simultaneously. They squeeze at the same time to fill up the ventricles. Um, after the atria have done their job of filling up the ventricles with the blood, now it's time for the ventricles to contract. So after each ventricle is filled by the atrium, the ventricles contract in sync with each other. So the, the left and right ventricles contract simultaneously, and that is what expels the blood out of the heart into the pulmonary loop and the systemic loop. The, you can see from the diagram here, the right ventricle pumps blood into the pulmonary loop, you know, into the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries, and the left ventricle pumps blood into the systemic loop, you know, starting at the aorta right there. Okay, if you've got that, you've got the, the basics of what's called the, uh, the cardiac cycle, the pumping of the blood. But let me show you in the cartoon form here. Uh, so here's the heart, and here's the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle, and here you see some of the blood vessels. Um, so 
let's begin with the atria. So let's imagine the atria have, have filled up with blood, you know, the blood returning to the heart. Uh, and so, so, well, let's see. So, the, yeah, so the, the cardiac cycle begins with the atria contracting in sync with each other and uh, to, to fill up the ventricles. And again, I think I have that here. Atria contract in sync with each other uh, to fill up the ventricles below them. So the, the right atrium fills up the right ventricle and the left atrium fills up the left ventricle. And then now that the ventricles have been filled with blood, now it's time for the ventricles to contract. And when I click the button here, we'll, we will see the ventricles contracting. Oh, but actually before I leave the atria, quick pop quiz, what blood vessels filled up the right atrium with blood? Give you a hint. There's one coming from on top and there's one coming from below. Superior inferior vena cava, right. Those are the two veins at the end of the systemic loop. So, yeah, so the right vent atrium got filled with blood from the superior and inferior vena cavae, which are the ends of the systemic loop. And the left atrium got filled with blood from which vein? No. The aorta, it carries blood out of the heart. Pulmonary vein, right. So that's the pulmonary vein right there. It's the one that filled up the left atrium with blood. Anyway, so the atria contracted in sync with each other at the start of the cardiac cycle too fill the ventricles with blood. Now the ventricles are filled with blood. And so now it's time for the ventricles to contract and expel the blood out of the heart. Okay, so who can tell me the right ventricle is pumping blood into which loop? Pullman, very good. And the left ventricle is pumping blood into the systemic loop. And here we see it in the diagram here. Here's the right ventricle pumping blood into the pulmonary loop to be more specific into the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary uh, arteries. And the left ventricle pumps blood into the systemic loop to be more specific, starting with the aorta right there, the first artery of the systemic loop. Good. So there's the ventricles pumping blood into the loops. And then after that step, the ventricles relax. After the, the ventricles have done their job expelling blood out of the heart, the ventricles relax. And two things happen during that relaxation time. The, when the ventricles are relaxing, the atria have a chance to refill themselves up with blood. And then the next cardiac cycle begins. Remember, the cardiac cycle always begins with the atria contracting together. Oh, here we go. Filling up the ventricles. And then the ventricles contract together to expel the blood out of the heart. And then the ventricles relax. And during the relaxation time, the atria refill. And also during the relaxation time of the ventricles, that's when the atria contract to refill the ventricles. And that whole those three steps that I just talked about, the atria contracting together to fill the ventricles, the ventricles contracting to expel blood out of the heart, and then the ventricles relaxing. Those three things together are called the cardiac cycle. And we, we define it like this. It's the, the repeated series of events in the heart, you know, like that. The repeated series of events in the heart that results in blood, blood pumping. And each time your heart goes through a cardiac cycle, it makes some heart sounds. You know, if you ever use a stethoscope on someone's chest or put your ear to someone's chest, you can hear sounds like lubbed up. At least that's the way they describe it, lubbed up. And so each lubbed up is one cardiac cycle. But actually, let me add something to it. So remember, each cardiac cycle makes a lubbed up noise. Kind of surprisingly, the lubbed up does not start at the beginning. The lubbed up comes on the last two steps. So the, the atria together at the beginning is actually silent. The lub happens when the ventricles contract, and the dup happens when the ventricles relax. OK, well, um, so obviously the cardiac cycle involves contractions and relaxations of these four heart chambers. There's some special terminology to describe contraction and relaxation of heart chambers. And this terminology is, is the word systole and diastole. Systole means contraction of a heart chamber. Diastole means relaxation of a heart chamber. So we can talk about atrial systole, meaning that's when the atria are contracting. Or we can talk about atrial diastole, that's when the atria are relaxing. Or we can talk about ventricular systole, when the ventricles are contracting 
and ventricular diastole when the ventricles are relaxing. And I think I added the words here for the ventricles. So yeah, the, what you see in the cartoon here, right here is what the ventricles are doing. So the ventricles are in systole, they're contracting. The ventricles are now in diastole, they're, they are relaxing. And I wish I'd put some other words up there for the, for the atria, because they also, you know, you also have atrial systole and atrial diastole. Um, but you might remember the atria, when the atria are contracting, the ventricles are not yet contracting. And when the ventricles are contracting, the atria are relaxing. And so, I, yeah, I wish I would have added systole and diastole for the atria up at the top, because then you see they're opposites. You know, when the, when the ventricles are in diastole, at least part of that time, the atria are in systole. And when the ventricles are in systole, when the ventricles are contracting, like you'll see here, that's when the atria go in diastole. So the, the atria and the ventricles are essentially in opposite phases from each other in terms of being in systole and diastole. When one's relaxing, the other's contracting and vice versa. Okay, well, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the heart, but let me just mention something about blood vessels quickly. You know, the, the blood vessels are these tubes that your blood flows through, and the flow of blood through each blood vessel is supposed to be a one-way street. And what I mean by that is, in each blood vessel, the, blow is, the blood is only supposed to flow in one direction. It's not supposed to reverse itself and ever go backwards. That would just be very inefficient circulation if your blood just went backwards through your blood vessels. Yeah, so all blood vessels, the flow is, is just always supposed to be in one direction and one direction only. Well, it's the same with the chambers of your heart. You know, notice right here, the atria are pumping blood down into the ventricles, and then the ventricles are shooting blood up into the aorta and pulmonary arteries. All of those movements are only supposed to be one direction. You're, so you're not ever supposed to have blood flowing backwards from the ventricles uh, to the atria. And you're not ever supposed to having fl blood flow backwards down from the aorta and pulmonary arteries down into the, uh, into the ventricles. That's just not the way the blood is supposed to go. So to ensure that the blood only flows between the, the chambers in the proper directions that it's supposed to flow, the heart has some one-way valves built into it that only allow the blood to flow in the proper direction between the chambers. All right, so there are you know four chambers in the heart, and each chamber has a one of these one-way valves at its exit. So there are four one-way valves in the heart. These are two of those valves. These are the valves that are the at the exit of the atria. And those are called the AV valves. Oh, do I have them named? Oh, I thought I had them named. Well, I guess I didn't. Hold on one second then. OK, yeah, sorry. I thought I had them named, but they don't. So these valves right here, that at the exit to the atria, where the atria touch the uh, uh, ventricles, those are called the AV valves. And so you have, a, you have a right AV valve at the exit to the right atrium and a left AV valve at the exit to the um, uh, left atrium. Notice, uh, oh, actually, well, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and you also have another pair of valves here at the exits of the, of the, um, uh, of the ventricles. These are called the semilunar valves. So this is the right semilunar valve, and here's the left semilunar valve right there. Yeah, so those, those your two AV valves and your two semilunar valves are constantly opening and shutting to uh, make sure the blood only flows in the correct direction. OK, well, so remember a minute ago I said that with every cardiac cycle, there's a lubbed up noise, lubbed up, lubbed up. Guess what makes the noise? The valve shutting, yeah. Just like if you slam a door shut, it makes a big noise. The lubbed ups are the sounds of the valve shutting. Now, if you open a door, it doesn't really make much noise. And so the opening of valves does not cause a noise. It's the slamming shut that makes the noise. And to be more specific, the lub noise, remember it's lubbed up. The first noise, the lub of the cardiac cycle is the AV valve shutting. And the second noise of the hard sounds, the dup, is the, or the semilunar valve shutting. 
And so let's see if I can do that here. Uh, so look at the AV valves. They're going to shut in just a second. Lub. And now the semilunar valves are going to shut. Dump. Good. Matter of fact, I think if I click on it, it might speed it up a little bit here. Lub. Dump. Lub. Dump. Yeah, so AV valve shut. The lub is the AV valve shutting, and the dump is the semilunar valve shutting. The lub is when the ventricles are contracting, and the dump is when the ventricles are relaxing. And I think I got that here. Yeah, the lub sound is the AV valve shutting, and that happens at the beginning of ventricular systole when the ventricles are contracting, and the dup is the semilunar valve shutting, and that happens at the beginning of ventricular diastole when the ventricles are, are relaxing. So lub dup, lub dup. Awesome. Um, all right. Um, well, any hard sound questions so far? Kind of neat. OK, so let me give you a thought question. So imagine you're a doctor or a nurse, and you get out the stethoscope. Here's the stethoscope. Uh, yeah, so uh, you drop your stethoscope on the floor, and then you pick it up and clean it off. And let's say you're, you're auscultating, which means listening to your patient's heart sounds. And they're supposed to be nice, crisp, lubbed up, lubbed up. But on this particular patient, it sounds like this. It sounds lub, lub, lub. What valves are damaged? Well, those aren't, those aren't valves. Semilunar valves, right. Because notice the first sound, the lub, was nice and loud and sharp and crisp. But it was the dup sound that was more muffled. Uh, and so, the, so yeah, doctors and nurses can diagnose bad heart valves, faulty heart valves, by listening to your, auscultating your heart sounds. And yeah, so if the if the lub is crisp but the dub is kind of is kind of muffled, then they know your semilunar valves are damaged. But if the lub was kind of muffled but the dup was sharp, then they would know that your AV valves are damaged. So getting back to the cardiac cycle for a second. So remember the for the cardiac cycle is basically the pumping actions of the heart, the repeated uh, actions in the heart that result in blood pumping. And the cardiac cycle starts, remember, with the atria contracting together, and then step two is the ventricles contracting together, and then the ventricles relaxing. Well, that takes a certain amount of coordination within the heart. You know, the atria have to contract in sync with each other while the ventricles are relaxing, and then the ventricles have to contract in, in sync with each other while the atria are relaxing, and then the ventricles have to, have to relax in sync with each other. Well, so how does the heart coordinate all those contractions and relaxations of the various chambers at the right time? Well, here's the way it works. Inside the heart are some special tissues called the conducting tissues of the heart. And here's the definition. It's a network of cells inside the heart that generate and conduct electrical signals that cause the, the, the muscles of the atrium and ventricles to, to beat, to contract and relax at the proper time. Okay, here's kind of a review question. What organ system in the body did we already talk about that generates electrical signals to cause muscles to contract and relax? Nervous system, right. Uh, that was one of the things, the big things I talked about in the nervous system, that its signals are electrical signals, and one of the things it does, especially the motor neurons, is get muscles to contract and relax. And so you might think, well, this is nervous tissue inside the heart, but it's not. Uh, kind of bizarrely, you're, this conducting tissues of the heart, which, by the way, are the orange-colored tissues they're showing here, are not nervous tissue. They're actually highly modified cardiac, cardiac muscle cells. They're, they are cardiac muscle cells that are specializing in generating and conducting electrical signals within the heart, but they are not nervous tissue. They are modified cardiac muscle cells. Or I sometimes say they are cardiac muscle cells that think they're neurons, but they're not. OK, um, so as you can see here, you find the, these conducting tissues of the heart all throughout the heart. But that being said, there are a couple of special clusters, clumps of these conducting tissues that have very important roles. And I want you to know these, these, these 
sequence conducting tissue clumps by name, important clusters by names. We'll start off with this one right here. So notice that this, this clump of the conducting tissues is in the upper part of the right atrium. That's called the SA node. It stands for the sinoatrial node, the conducting tissue node in the upper right atrium. And it's a very important part of the conducting tissues. It's sometimes called the pacemaker of the heart because the, the, the rate that it sends out its contraction and relaxation signals determines your overall heart rate. So if it sends out its contraction and relaxation signals 65 times per minute, then your overall heart rate is 65 beats per minute. And if it sends out its contraction and relaxation signals 80 times per minute, then your overall heart rate is 80 beats per minute. So that, yeah, that's why they call it the, the pacemaker of the heart. It sets the heart rate for the entire heart. But that being said, it's only wired directly to the atria. If you look at these kind of black arrows in this diagram, that shows that it's sending its signal, signals only to the atria. Yeah, so the SA node only has direct control over the atria's contractions and relaxations. And yet it also sets the rate for the entire heart, the atria and the ventricles. So you might say, well, Mr. Eden, you just contradicted yourself. You told us it was only wired to the atria. So how does it set the rate for the ventricles too? Well, that's where this other clump comes in. This other bundle of conducting tissues that you see down here, this other clump of conducting tissues that you see down here is called the AV node. And basically it's the relay station between the signals from the SA node and sending those signals down to the ventricles. Okay, so let me explain that. So that AV node right there stands for the atrioventricular node. Notice that the AV node is also inside the right atrium, just like the SA node is. Uh, but if you look at the diagram closely, notice there's a little arrow here between the SA node and the AV node. So that shows that the, the SA node is wired to the AV node. Uh, in other words, there, there's, there's some conducting tissues that carry the signals from the SA node to the AV node. And so the AV node is listening in on the SA node signals. The AV node gets some of those signals from the SA node, those contraction relaxation signals. And when the AV node gets those signals, it delays briefly, and then it relays those signals on down to the ventricles. And so that's how the ventricles stay in timing with what the atria are doing, because the AV node gets those signals from the SA node you know, that the SA node is sending to the atria. And then after delaying for just a part of a second, it then shoots those signals down to the ventricles. And so that way the ventricles contractions and relaxations can stay in sync with the atria's contractions and relaxations. Now, does anybody want to hazard a guess? Why is it important for the AV node to delay briefly before it shoots the signals on down to the ventricles? stumped you. Well, so remember with the cardiac cycle, the start of the cardiac cycle is the atria contracting together, and the ventricles have to be relaxed at that time to allow themselves to be filled up with the blood from the atria. And so you don't want the atria and the ventricles contracting simultaneously. And so that's why this AV node has a bit of a delay built into it, so that when the SA node is getting the atria to contract, you don't want the ventricles contracting. And so the AV node, when it receives that contraction signal, delays that signal just a fraction of a second before shooting it down to get the ventricles to contract. So that, that delay is what allows the atria to contract first, and then a moment later, the ventricles to contract for a, for a proper cardiac cycle, atria together, ventricles together, uh, relax. Okay, now, so uh, if the these conducting tissues, oh, actually, uh, sorry, need to get this right here. Um, so all of these conducting tissues live inside the heart, so to speak, and they can, they can generate their own electrical signals to keep the heart beating without any connection at all to the nervous system. Um, so the, the heart is the only muscle in your body that can contract and relax without any connection to the nervous system because, yeah, because it's got this internal system, the, these conducting tissues of the heart. And I'll tell you something kind of interesting and at the same time kind of gross um, that demonstrates that the heart 
can generate its own contraction relaxation signals independent of the nervous system when the conquistadors first came to the americas the aztecs were still practicing human sacrifice and the conquistadors watched some of this and they 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 reported like you know they they would lay the sacrificial person out on an altar of some sort and then the the aztec priest would get a knife and very quickly cut the guy's poor guy's chest open and pull out his beating heart blah 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 and the conquistadors said you know that they would watch the heart beating for several minutes you know eventually it runs out of blood but uh for several minutes it would go lubbed up lubbed up lubbed up and obviously it's completely disconnected from the poor guy's nervous system right uh and yet it can still beat rhythmically for for several minutes and so you know that demonstrates that the conducting tissues can generate all the heart's contraction relaxation signals without any connection at all to the nervous system but all that being said the heart's conducting tissues want need to know when they need to increase the heart rate or decrease the heart rate you know they, they know how to generate heartbeat signals but not when it's appropriate to speed up or slow down the heart rate and so in in your body there is a connection between the nervous system and the SA node uh, you remember of course the SA node sets the pace for the whole heart um, so uh, this part of your nervous system called your sympathetic division uh, has some neurons that synapse with your SA node and who remembers the sympathetic division becomes more active under what circumstances that, that's essentially it I, I was going to say um, anger or fear uh, yeah um, if it's a fight or flight situation the neurons of your sympathetic division become more active and so when your SA node gets signals from the sympathetic division what does it do to your heart rate yeah, you're right it increases because that's that's the appropriate response of your heart in a stressful fight or flight situation is increased heart rate the parasympathetic division was this other part of the nervous system those neurons of the parasympathetic division become more active during calm peaceful and relaxed situations and so when your SA node gets signals from the parasympathetic division the SA node knows that it's a calm and peaceful time and the appropriate response is to slow down your heart rate and so well yeah so stimulation from the parasympathetic division makes your SA node slow down your heart rate and again it should make sense that the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions synapse with the SA node because the SA node is the pacemaker that sets the, the overall heart rate well one of the important things that we learned from our discussion discussion of the conducting tissues so far is that the SA node and the AV node have to send their signals with coordinated and well-regulated timing for the heart to beat correctly in other words the the signals have to go to the atria to contract those atria simultaneously and first you know to fill up the ventricles and then the contraction signals have to be sent to the ventricles simultaneously to get the ventricles to contract so yeah the, the point is that the, the the electrical signaling from the SA node and the AV node and all the other conducting tissues has to be done in a coordinated and well-timed well-regulated way well uh, damage to the nodes or to the other conducting tissues can cause those conducting tissues to make uncoordinated uh, signals which can cause chaotic uh, and uncoordinated contractions uh, in the heart. Uh, just as one example uh, of something that might cause damage to the conducting tissues and therefore cause the signaling to become uncoordinated is a heart attack. We're going to talk more about heart attacks a little bit later on in this lecture uh, on the cardiovascular system. But just for now, as long as you know that heart attacks involve damage to the, um, to the heart tissue, uh, that's all you have to know. Okay, so if there's something that damages the heart tissue, such as a heart attack, yeah, uh, some of the conducting tissues can get damaged, and then those conducting tissues can start sending out mistimed, uncoordinated signalings, and that can cause the heart rhythms, the, the coordinated beating of the hearts, to become uncoordinated. Well, there are different types of arrhythmias. Arrhythmia means uh, where the heart is not following its proper rhythm. Um, anyway, there are different types of arrhythmias, 
and one of the most deadly, one of the most uh, 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 potentially lethal ones are called ventricular fibrillations. It's sometimes called cardiac arrest, but I prefer the term uh, ventric ventricular fibrillations. So if you look at the um, if you look at the lecture handout, it defines them as rapid, uncoordinated contractions of the ventricles. And let me uh, try to illustrate that. So this is not ventricular fibrillations. This is supposed to be the heart beating in its normal, steady, coordinated way. You know, atria together at the beginning of the cardiac cycle, and then ventricles contract together, and then ventricles relax. Yeah, so this represents the normal, nice, healthy, coordinated cardiac cycle. Ventricular fibrillations would look like this. Uh, instead of that nice coordinated timing of the contractions and relaxations, it's rapid, chaotic, uncoordinated contractions uh, of the ventricles. And, you know, it's almost as if the ventricles were, were more just sort of twitching rather than contracting and relaxing in, in an effective way. So uh, when the heart is in ventricular fibrillations, there's no effective pumping of the blood going on because the contractions of the ventricles are are, are so rapid and and uncoordinated. Uh, yeah, so if in in ventricular fibrillations there's no effective pumping of the blood going on, so the person has no circulation. Their blood is not circulate circulating, and you can't survive like that. If the blood is not circulating, a person will start to have irreparable brain damage within five minutes and they'll be dead within five to ten minutes. So uh, yeah, obviously ventricular fibrillations is a very serious uh, arrhythmia. Um, so what could cause the heart to go into ventricular fibrilla fibrillations? Well, I mentioned already um, a heart attack. Uh, here we go. Uh, a heart attack. Yeah, a heart attack damages the tissues of the heart, including the conducting tissues, and so it can cause the conducting tissues to start sending out these un uncoordinated contraction and relaxation signals. Another thing that can affect the proper rhythm of the heart is the concentration of certain ions in the blood, uh, namely uh, sodium ions, potassium ions, and calcium ions. If these are outside their normal homeostatic con concentration ranges in the blood, that can make the heart start going into abnormal rhythms. Now, I don't want to give you the idea that if any of these is even slightly outside its normal range, then the person just dies of, of, of ventricular fibrillations. That's not true. Uh, if, if these were just slightly outside their normal ranges, then the person would still survive. They, they, their heart might have a slightly irregular rhythm, but it's not, it would not be ventricular fibrillations. But the point I'm making is the more these are outside their normal ranges, the more severely the heart will be beating in an ir irregular manner. And if they're enough outside their normal homeostatic range, then yes, they can make the heart uh, go into ventricular, ventricular fibrillations. Now, why are these three ions in particular important to the proper rhythm of your heart? Well, because the conducting tissues of the heart and the cardiac muscle cells of the heart use these three ions for depolarization and repolarization. So if these are not at their normal concentrations in your blood, then the conducting tissues and the cardiac muscle cells just don't receive the right concentrations of them to do normal depolarizations and repolarizations. As an example of the importance of these ions to the proper beating of the heart, um, you, you might have heard that there are these things lethal injections. For instance, if they have to put an animal to sleep, they give it an injection that, that, that uh, kills the animal. Or uh, sometimes if they're executing a prisoner, they, they do so by giving the prisoner, prisoner a lethal injection. Well, one of the main ingredients of these lethal injections is a large concentration of potassium ions. Um, and the idea is it, it, it creates such a large imbalance of potassium ions in the blood that it puts the person's heart into, into ventricular fibrillations. All right, so um, as I said, if a person's heart is in ventricular fibrillations, that is a deadly situation. They can only survive somewhere between 5 and 10 minutes because their blood isn't circulating. Um, so what does one do if a person's heart is in ventricular fibr fibrillations? Well, um, if nothing else, you can do CPR uh, on the person, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And this is not a first aid class, and I, I can't really teach you how to do CPR 
um, here over uh, by watching this video. But what I am saying is that um, if you know how to do CPR, you can do it to keep a person alive for more than 10 minutes if that person is in ventricular fib fibrillations. Now, you can't keep them alive forever by doing CPR, but you can extend the time that they're alive for more than 10 minutes, uh, you know, and hopefully that will buy enough time for actual trained medical professionals to arrive um, to, to perhaps uh, uh, get the person out of vent ventricular, fibril ventricular fibrillations. Oh, so maybe I should mention, so uh, when, the when the medical people, uh, personnel do arrive, how do they get the person out of ventricular fibrillations? And the shorter an answer is they defibrillate the person with an electrical shock. And you've probably seen uh, this, if nowhere else than on, on medical TV shows, that if a person's heart is in ventricular fibrillations, they use some, a device called a defibrillator that has two electrically charged metal paddles. And they put these onto the person's chest and they send a huge electric shock through the heart. And with a little luck, that defibrillates the heart, that, that makes the, the heart go out of ventricular fibrillations and back into its normal rhythm. It used to be that only trained medical professionals were allowed to use these defibrillators. But with increased uh, computer technology, they now have automated defibrillators that anybody can use. You sometimes see these on the walls of buildings. It, it says uh, AED, Automated External uh, Defibrillator. And yeah, so it's a device that anybody can use. It, it, they, they encourage people to get Red Cross training on how to use these uh, automated defibrillators. But, you know, if, if you see someone who you think might be having uh, car, um, um, ventricular fibrillations, then, you know, you know, you want to try to save their life even if you haven't been trained on one of these defibrillators. And I've never, thankfully, I've never had to use one. Um, I've never been in a situation where, where I had to treat somebody who was in ventricular fibrillations. But the people I've talked to who have used them say that they are, these devices are very user-friendly, that um, when you take the, the defibrillator off the wall, it has a programmed voice, a computer voice that talks to you. It says, you know, hook these two uh, electrodes up to the person's chest. It, it tells you what to do. And then um, you don't have to decide whether the person is actually in ventricular fibrillations or not. The device can measure that measures that for you. And so if it decides that the person is in ventricular fibrillations and could benefit from being defibrillated with a shock, it, it does that for you. It, it tells you, stand back, I'm about to deliver a shock. And then you know it delivers the shock to, to, to the person for you. Uh, anyway, so just to summarize, ventricular fibrillations are sometimes called cardiac arrest. And it's where the ventricles are doing rapid and uncoordinated contractions to the extent that there's no effective pumping of the blood. So far, pretty much everything in this cardiovascular system lecture has been focusing on the heart, you know, whose job it is to pump the blood. Another part of the cardiovascular system are the blood vessels, so we're now going to shift for a while and focus in on the blood vessels. Um, we are going to come back to the heart eventually, but for right now it's all about the blood vessels. So they are the tubes, so the heart pumps the blood, but you need some tubes to carry that blood properly to all the organs of the body and then eventually back from those organs to the heart. So that's the job of the, these blood vessels. There are three types of blood vessels, arteries, and who remembers, how do we define arteries? Carry blood away from the heart towards various organs. Veins, which we define as, uh, sorry, I didn't hear. One more time. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they carry the, the blood returning to the heart. And the capillaries, which we haven't really defined yet. Um, we'll define the capillaries in a, in a few minutes, but just as a preview, they are tiny blood vessels, and you find them inside the organs, whereas if you, all the, the arteries and the veins are not within the organs. The arteries and veins are outside the organs. Anyway, um, yeah, we'll talk about the capillaries more in a few minutes. But this section right here focuses on the structures of the arteries and the veins. OK, uh, well, so yeah, the arteries and veins are well, they're organs, and they're, they're hollow tubes to carry the blood away from the heart and, and towards the heart for the arteries and the veins. This next slide shows a transverse cut, a cross section of an artery and a vein. Arteries and veins have similar structure in terms of 
what tissues make up their walls. And so uh, I want to first go through how arteries and veins are, are the same as each other, and then I'll tell you a few differences between them. But overall, they're, they're more similar to each other than they are different from each other. Okay, so here's the, here are their similarities. Arteries and veins, veins both have a lumen, and that, the term lumen just means the hollow space inside. Um, so you know, right here is the, the lumen of this artery, and right here is the lumen of this vein. And incidentally, the word lumen does not just apply to blood vessels for any of your hollow organs. The hollow space is called the lumen, like your stomach has a lumen for the food to go through, and your, your bladder has, a, has a, its lumen for the, for the urine to go through. It just means the hollow area inside an organ. Okay, but let's look at the tissue layers that you find that make up the walls of the artery and the vein. There are three tissue layers. They call them the tunicas. Oh, good review question here. Which sense organ had three tissue layers that we called the tunics? One of your sense organs. Give me a hint. One of them was a white layer called the sclera. The eye. Yeah, remember the eye had three tunics. The outer layer, the outer tunic, the middle tunic, and the inner tunic. And like the inner tunic was the retina. The middle tunic was some blood vessels called the choroid coat. And the outer tunic of the eye was mostly this white area called the sclera, but there was also the cornea, which is also part of the outer tunic. Anyway, so the eye is an organ with three tunics. The blood vessels have tunicas, you know, almost the same word. And, and again, there are, there are three of them, the tunica interna, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. The, let's start with the tunica interna. That's the one that they're showing in kind of golden colored there. It's epithelial tissue. And hopefully you might have guessed that. When we were talking about the tissues of the body, I said that for every hollow organ in the body, the inner lining is always going to be epithelial tissue. And it is. That's what the tunica media is. Uh, sorry, tunica interna is. Uh, to be more specific, it's simple squamous epithelial tissue. If you look closely there, maybe you'll see that. Uh, remember, squamous means the cells are kind of flattened shaped. And maybe you can see it a little better over here in the vein. Uh, yeah, so squamous epithelial cells are sort of flat shaped. And simple means there's only one layer of the, uh, of the epithelial cells. Anyway, that's the tunica interna, simple squamous epithelial tissue. And it's just, it just there in these blood vessels to provide a nice smooth surface for the blood to flow across. Moving outward, we get into this layer that looks kind of red colored, both here in the artery and in the vein. That's called the tunica media, and it's smooth muscle. Here's why it's there. It's there to control the, 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 the blood flow through any given artery or vein. So imagine a garden hose, and you're out in your backyard watering your plants. Not that you need to do that today, but let's say it's during the summer and you're watering your plants. And you've got a plant over here you've been watering, and now you want to water a plant over there. Well, what you might do is just squeeze on the hose to temporarily slow down or stop the water flow while you bring your hose over here to the next plant, and then you'd release, release your, the force of your grasp, and you release your fingers. And so that allows the hose to you know, flow more water onto that plant over there. Well, that's the way your, your blood vessels work. Sometimes your body might want to adjust the, blood, the amount of blood that's flowing to a particular organ. And so to do that, the body can cause the tunica media smooth muscle to contract. That's like squeezing your garden hose shut to reduce the blood flow to the organ. Or if the body wants more blood to flow to an organ, the body can relax the tunica media smooth muscle. And so that is like relaxing your grip on your hose, and that lets the water flow through. So that lets the blood flow through. The outermost tunica is called the tunica externa. It's that tough, leathery tissue, dense connective tissue. And so it just makes like a tough leather sheath to form the outside of the artery or vein uh, to protect and strengthen the blood vessel. OK, so all arteries and all veins have a lumen hollow space inside and a tunica interna, tunica media, and tunica externa. So in that way, arteries are pretty similar to veins. Now let's talk about the differences. 
feast your eyes on the tunica media, the smooth muscle layer, notice that the tunica media is huge. It's very thick in arteries, but it's very, very thin in veins. Why is that? Well, remember what I said, the, the, the goal, the function of that tunica media is to regulate the blood flow. Like, you know, if the body decides it needs less blood flow to an organ, the, the blood vessel arteries can, uh, tunica media can contract, and if the body decides there's supposed to be more blood flow to an organ, the tunica media can relax to allow more blood flow. The arteries regulate the blood flow more than the veins do, and so you know, it's kind of, kind of the job of the arteries to regulate the blood flow that's not the job of the veins. Uh, so that's why the body gives the arteries a thicker tunica media than the veins have. I guess they say everything's got a price. So if you're gonna have a thicker tunica media, there's less room for the lumen, right? Because the tunica, the wall with the very thick tunica media is so thick that there's just less room for the hollow lumen inside. And so that's why the arteries tend to have a smaller lumen than the veins do, because the arteries have that thicker tunica media than the veins do. So here in a few minutes, I'll show you an actual photograph of a cross section of an artery and a vein. And I'll say, which do you think is the artery and which do you think is the vein? And so the one that has the thicker wall and therefore the smaller lumen is the artery and the one that has the thinner wall and therefore the larger lumen is, is the vein. Okay, some more uh, differences between arteries and veins. If we go back to this kind of homespun cartoon of the cardiovascular system, um, the one with the stripy blood vessels in the lungs, that's the pulmonary loop. And so ignore that loop for a second. All the other parts of this diagram are the systemic loop. You know, it begins there with the aorta, and then the aorta has some smaller arteries that branch off of it, and then those feed blood into the organs, and then now we begin some veins carrying blood of the systemic loop back from the various organs to the heart. Uh, and I think I pointed out when I showed this cartoon before, here I'm only showing four organs, but obviously the systemic loop contains uh, you know, over a thousand organs if you add up all of your muscles and 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 digestive organs and bones as, as separate organs. Um, anyway, so what I was pointing out at this point is if you look at the diagram of the systemic loop, all the arteries are red and are the, all the veins are blue. And remember, bright red colored blood means oxygen rich blood and blue colored blood means low oxygen blood. And so in your systemic loop, all the arteries are red, they carry high oxygen blood and all the veins are blue, they carry low oxygen blood. Now, you never really can, you, sometimes if you look at your skin, you can see some blood vessels inside there. Uh, like here, I can see some right on my wrist right there. Those have to be systemic loop, right? Because your pulmonary loop is, is just here inside your thoracic cavity between your, your heart and your lungs. You never really get to see those blood vessels, but pretty much blood vessels in any other part of your body have to be systemic loop blood vessels. So any blood vessels that you can see in your skin have to be systemic loop arteries and veins. And so that means if they look blue, you're looking at veins. And if they look red, you're looking at arteries. And you can see them pretty well right here. You know, very blue colored lines right here. And so those have to be veins I'm seeing through my skin there because they're they're blue colored and they are in the systemic loop. And if I see any red colored blood vessels in there, that's also part of the systemic loop, so those have to be arteries. All right, uh, well, another difference is there are some small arteries that we call arterioles, and there are some small veins that we call venules. And let me show you where they are in this diagram. Um, so this right there is the biggest artery in the body, the beginning of the systemic loop. That's the aorta, which is obviously an artery. Now, I'm going to use capital A to mean an artery. And then after the, uh, the aorta, you get some other arteries that branch off of it. And those are still called arteries. Uh, you know, they're not the aorta, but they're still called arteries after they branch off the aorta. But like, look right here. This artery right here comes up to this organ. 
and just before the organ, just before that blood arrives at the organ, that artery branches into some tinier arteries. Those are called arterioles. Um, oop, there we go. I'm using the little a to mean arteriole. Yeah, so the tiniest arteries that you find just before the, the blood arrives at the organ, those tiny arteries that actually go into the organ are called arterioles. It, it, it's, it's a type of artery, it just means a, a tiny artery, it's an arteriole. And so looking at this organ down here, here are these tiny arteries that feed blood into that organ. Those are the arterioles that are feeding blood into that organ. organ. And you know, th those arterioles get their blood from this artery right here that's going towards that organ. And right here, here's an artery carrying blood towards this organ. And these are little arterioles that branch off it to feed the blood into that organ. And likewise, here's an artery carrying blood to that organ at the bottom. And here are the arterioles that branch off of it to feed the blood into that organ. Same concept with the veins, but we call the small ones that, that come out of the organ venules. Here are some three little venules coming out of this organ, and then they merge together to form this big vein right here. Here are some little venules coming out of this organ. They merge to form this vein right here. Here are venules from this organ. Here are some venules from this organ. And all those veins in the systemic loop eventually come together to form the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava right there. All right, and uh, some final differences between the arteries and veins. I don't really, this diagram here doesn't really show blood pressure. Oop, go back. Uh, here we go. This diagram doesn't really show blood pressure, but the blood pressure is highest in the arteries. And the blood pressure um, gets lower as you go from arteries into veins. And so I tried to summarize that here, that, that arteries have just have higher blood pressure than veins do. And why is that? Well, you know, I don't know. To me, it kind of makes intuitive sense. Uh, like, the further you get away from something, the less of an effect it has. Like, this light is pretty bright if I stare into it. But if I walk away from it, it's not as bright, right? And so uh, think, of, think of the heart as generating a lot of your blood pressure. And so the arteries are closest to the heart, right? And so they tend to get a lot of blood pressure in them. But as you go through the systemic loop and get further away from the heart, so to speak, then the heart's effect on blood pressure gets less and less. And so, I don't know, to me, it sort of intuitively makes sense that you get very low blood pressure, um, uh, lower blood pressure in, in the veins than, than in the arteries. Now, the one of the effects of blood pressure is that it helps the blood to flow. So with arteries, the blood flows through them very nicely, uh, very forcefully, uh, because they have such high blood pressure. But when you get into the veins, since there's a lot lower blood pressure, there's not as much force making the blood to flow. So to help the blood to flow in the right direction through the veins, the veins come equipped with some one-way valves that, that arteries do not have. And so here we are to our cross-section of the artery and vein again. And so now I've added these. So these are some one-way valves that are built into the veins to ensure that the blood only flows in the proper direction. And what's that proper direction? Well, it's back towards the heart. The, the arteries don't need one-way valves because the arteries have that higher blood pressure to make sure the, the blood is flowing in the right direction. Oh, um, I was going to mention something. Um, so hopefully you've you or nobody you ever know will ever get a really serious injury where blood is, is spurting out of the person. But when a person does get a very severe injury, injury like that, if you see the injury going squirt, squirt, squirt with the blood coming out, and maybe in another area the blood is not squirting, it's just sort of drizzling out, which one of those do you think is a torn artery? The squirting, right, because arteries have a lot higher blood pressure. And so if you tear an artery, the blood goes squirt with every heartbeat, squirt, squirt. But if it's a vein, because veins have lower blood pressure, the, there's still a lot of bleeding, but it's more sort of oozing out than, than squirting out forcefully. Um, anyway, um, so what I was saying is veins have one-way valves of dense connective tissue to make sure the blood flows in the proper direction. And what is that proper direction? It's towards the heart. And you can see this diagram here. There's a one-way valve in this vein, and so it allows the blood to flow back towards the heart. But if the blood wanted to try to backflow, then the 
one way valve in the vein closes to 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 stop the back flow there's a concept that kind of relates to the one way valves in the veins and it's not in your handout but it's something that I do want you to know it's called the 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 skeletal muscle pump okay so in this diagram this red stripy looking thing is supposed to be one of your skeletal muscles which skeletal muscle is it supposed to be it could be any of them I think it's supposed to be your gastric in, in this diagram I think it's supposed to be your gastrocnemius which is your calf muscle or one of your calf muscles okay so notice that there's a vein that's going right through this skeletal muscle here it is well when you do any sort of physical activity just like walking you're contracting and relaxing your skeletal muscles you know like to walk I have to contract and relax my gastrocnemius calf muscles well therefore you're helping your blood circulate because every time you contract that skeletal muscle it's going to end up squeezing on those veins that are going through the skeletal muscle and since those veins have one-way valves you know when when you squeeze on them that's going to cause the blood to flow and it will only flow in the right direction because of those one-way valves and so the, the upshot of all this is that you're anytime you use your skeletal muscles you're helping your circulation uh, by means of this skeletal muscle pump you know that the, your skeletal muscles contract squeeze on the veins and squirt that squirts the blood in the proper direction which is back towards your heart so any sort of physical activity helps your circulation if you for some reason decide you just want to sit on the couch for a week and not do any sort of physical activity at all you would have poor circulation during that week because you know your heart is still beating circulating your blood but you're not getting any of the skeletal muscle pump pumping of the blood whereas if you're a more active person your heart circulates your blood and you also get some additional circulation from your skeletal muscle pump so you have better circulation and that for that reason um, you're just healthier if, if you have a regular exercise regime because you're basically helping your heart circulate the blood every time you use your muscles here's a photograph here's a blood vessel here's a blood vessel do you think this one down here is an artery or a vein vein is correct why the, the, the lumen is bigger right and look at the, the wall of the vein it's a lot thinner whereas the artery it has a smaller lumen and, and a thicker wall what part of the wall is actually the thicker part in the artery tunica media right the smooth yeah you can see it pretty dramatically there the arteries have a thicker wall because they have a thicker tunica media that, that smooth muscle layer and therefore they have a, a smaller lumen whereas veins have a very large lumen but a thinner wall because the vein has very little tunica media smooth muscle in its wall let's take a moment to briefly review the blood vessels that the blood flows through in the systemic loop as that blood flows out of the heart to the organs and then back to the heart well so the systemic loop begins right here in the aorta which is the largest artery in the body matter of fact it's the largest blood vessel in the body anyway the aorta is the largest artery and then branching off the aorta are smaller arteries like this is an artery here and this is an artery there and there's an artery and there's an artery and those arteries carry the blood to the various organs in the body but remember just before the artery reaches an, an organ it branches into smaller arteries called arterioles and then coming out of the organ are small veins called venules and then the venules merge to form smaller veins and the smaller veins merge to form larger veins and eventually the largest veins of the systemic loop which are the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava uh, return the blood to the heart to the right atrium of the heart okay but what i want to do now is um, talk a little bit more about the blood vessels inside the organ in other words the blood vessels between the arterioles and the venules that connect to an organ so imagine we're going to zoom in on an organ right here here's an artery bringing blood towards that organ here are the arterioles bringing blood into that organ here are the venules bringing blood out of the organ and here's a vein 
where those um, venules have converged. But yeah, let's imagine that we're going to make this organ kind of invisible so we can see the blood vessels inside of it like that. Well, uh, what you're seeing there are capillaries. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels. The capillaries are smaller than the arterioles and smaller than the venules. And as you can kind of see, the, the capillaries are formed when the arterioles branch into the smaller blood vessels, the capillaries. And then at the end of the organ, the capillaries merge to form the venules that come out of the, uh, come out of the organ. So in other words, the, the uh, capillaries carry blood from the arterioles to the venules, but the capillaries are inside the organ. Um, let's zoom in a little bit more. Oh, so yeah, those are the capillaries. And incidentally, uh, you can see the capillaries are arranged in kind of a almost like a spider web like matrix of capillaries. Those are called capillary beds. So you would say this is a capillary bed and that's a capillary bed, but the individual tiny, tiny tubules of the capillary beds are the capillaries. Anyway, let's zoom in on one of these uh, capillary beds. Okay, um, so yeah, just to review what it says in the lecture outline, capillaries are the smallest of the blood vessels. They are smaller than arterioles and smaller than, than venules. Uh, capillaries are only found inside organs. And yeah, they, they, they carry the blood between the arterioles and the venules. In other words, the capillaries are formed when the arterioles branch and form the capillaries. And then the capillaries at the other end of the organ eventually merge to form the venules that carry the blood out of the organ. Uh, okay, so, so uh, here's something interesting about capillaries. They are the only blood vessel type that exchanges substances with the tissues. And when I say when I say exchanges substances, like deliver oxygen and nutrients to the to the tissues and pick up cellular wastes like carbon dioxide uh, from the tissues. In other words, arteries and arterioles and venules and veins nothing enters or exits the blood from those blood vessels. The, the walls of arteries and veins and arterioles and venules are just too thick. The, the, the oxygen and nutrients and, and wastes and things can't pass through those walls. But only the capillaries have thin enough walls so that substances may enter or exit the blood. So it's only in the capillaries that you get exchange of substances uh, between the blood and, and uh, the tissues. So in this view we're, we're seeing right here, these kind of bluish looking dots are supposed to be the cells of, of the tissue of this organ. And this yellowish stuff outside there is, is what's called the tissue fluid. The tissue fluid is, is a watery fluid that, uh, that, that surrounds the cells uh, in a tissue. All right, so when I click the button here, we'll start to see the... Uh, blood in the capillaries exchanging uh, substances with the tissue fluid. For instance, one substance that gets exchanged is oxygen. So oxygen, in other words, can come out of the walls of the capillaries. And of course, the cells need that oxygen. They need it to do their cellular aerobic respiration. But interestingly, the blood does not hand the oxygens directly to the cells uh, of the tissue. Instead, what happens is the oxygen goes into the tissue fluid, and then the tissue fluid hands the oxygens uh, to the cells of that tissue. Uh, another substance that gets exchanged are the nutrients. I'm using G to represent glucose. Um, so yes, glucose also comes out through the walls of the capillaries, goes into the tissue fluids, and then the tissue fluid is what gives the glucose uh, to, to the cells. And I'm using glucose to represent many nutrients. You know, it's not just glucose as a nutrient, but amino acids and vitamins and ions and other nutrients that the cells need likewise come out of the blood in the capillaries and go into the tissue fluid, and then the tissue fluid hands uh, those nutrients to the cells. Uh, what else can we talk about? Carbon dioxide. The cells make carbon dioxide as they're doing cellular aerobic respiration, um, and so one of the jobs of the blood is to carry that carbon dioxide away, but the cells don't hand the carbon dioxide directly into the blood. Instead, instead the cells put the carbon dioxide into the tissue fluid, and then the tissue fluid um, passes the carbon dioxide to the blood in the capillaries. And we also, also could talk about water molecules. Um, the water molecules leak out of the uh, walls of the capillary and go into the tissue fluid 
Um, that's actually where the tissue fluid comes from, is water and other small molecules leaking out of the, uh, of the capillaries. But, you know, if the cells need water, they can get it from the tissue fluid, and of course the tissue fluid gets the water from the blood in the capillaries. Anyway, as you can see from this kind of busy-looking animation here, the, 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 the central concepts, again, are uh, capillaries are the only blood vessels that actually exchange materials with the tissues. And by typical materials we're talking about, oxygen, nutrients, carbon dioxide, uh, and water. Uh, but So those substances can pass through the walls of the capillary, and those substances go in and out of the tissue fluid, and then the tissue fluid exchanges those substances uh, with the cells. This is a figure I took from a textbook that shows exactly the same thing that we just saw in that animation. These kind of potato colored things represent the cells of the tissue. The blue part right here is the tissue fluid and here's a capillary. You can see some red blood cells inside of it. And yeah, just like we saw there, um, nutrients come out of the walls, through the walls of the capillary from the blood. Things like glucose and amino acids, water, um, oxygen gas also and goes into the tissue fluid then the tissue fluid hands those substances to the cells and carbon dioxide and other cellular wastes come out of the cells into the tissue fluid then the tissue fluid passes those substances through the wall of the capillary and that's how those substances get into the blood okay uh, now why is it that only the capillaries exchange materials with the cells of the of, of the organ and the answer is simply that the capillary wall is very thin. When we talked about the arteries and veins, remember they had three tunicas, the tunica interna, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. And those three together make for a very thick wall. And so arteries and veins is just too thick a wall for anything to enter or exit the, 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 the artery or vein. But capillaries only have the tunica interna, no tunica media or tunica externa. And remember, the tunica interna is, is the simple squamous epithelial tissue. So that's just a single layer of epithelial cells. That's all the capillaries got. And so that makes it very easy for materials to enter or exit the capillary. The, the, the wall of the capillary is so thin that some substances can diffuse right through the wall of the capillary. Oxygen's an example. The oxygen that's inside the blood can just diffuse directly through the cells of the wall of the capillary. Other substances are not able to diffuse through the wall, the, the, the cells that make up the wall of the capillary, but these other substances can still get in and out of the blood. There are little spaces between some of the cells, and so like water molecules are a good example. They get out of the capillary not by diffusing through the cells, but by working their way through these little gaps between the cells, like you see there. And um, incidentally, that's where the tissue fluid comes from. Remember, the, the tissue fluid is this watery liquid outside the capillary, you know, between the capillary and the cells. The tissue fluid is, is the water and other small molecules that seep out of the capillaries. The, the, the tissue fluid comes from the blood in the capillaries. Now, I'll show you something that I think is kind of uh, interesting. Um, we haven't talked about white blood cells yet, or at least we haven't talked about them a lot, but those are a type of blood cell, and they're part of your immune system. They, they help fight bacteria and viruses and other pathogens that have infected your body. Well, you know, white blood cells are blood cells, and so they, they generally live inside your blood vessels. But if you get an infection, that infection might be outside your blood vessels, you know, out, out here in, in your the tissues of your organs. So what I'm saying is there has to be a way for your white blood cells to exit your capillaries to get out, you know, outside your bloodstream to fight the pathogens. And even though it looks like it'd be difficult, these white blood cells can also wriggle through these little spaces. They have to kind of squeeze to do it, but they can, they can white blood cells can also exit your capillaries. Now that looks like a pretty tight squeeze, right? Because these little gaps in the walls of the capillaries are pretty small. Well, um, when we talk about the immune system, which will actually be more towards the end of the, of the uh, semester, when we talk about the immune system, I'll talk about a substance that your immune system makes called histamine. And just as a preview, histamine makes those gaps bigger. When your immune system is fighting some sort of pathogen that's infected you, 
your immune system manufactures this histamine, which makes the gaps bigger, and that the purpose is to allow more white blood cells to, to get out of your capillaries to help you help you fight the infection. Anyway, the point I'm making for today is, is that some substances can exit the capillary just by diffusing right through the cells of the wall. Other molecules, larger molecules and white blood cells have to squeeze through those little gaps in the walls. But nevertheless, the, the, the big picture is that that's one of the jobs of capillaries is to do exchange of material. Stuff can in, enter or exit the blood um, like, like you see here. Here's a nice photograph. Uh, there's a capillary right there. And you can see some of the red blood cells that are going through that capillary. And I like this photograph because, well, because it shows that, for one thing, that there are red blood cells inside the blood, but uh, you know that. But it also shows how thin capillaries are. I mean, this capillary, is, its wall is so thin that you can actually see through it in this microscope slide to see the blood cells inside. And it, it, this also shows how small capillaries are. And notice that the capillary is so small that pretty much the blood cells have to go single file um, through, through capillaries. Okay, well, we just got a minute or two left, so let me just finish off with some naming review here. So here's the heart, and it's pumping blood to this organ right here, and then here's the blood returning from the organ back to the heart. So this right here, artery, arterial, vein, venule, or capillary? Artery. artery, good. These right here where the blood is going into the, entering the organ are uh, arterioles. Arterials. What would you say? Article? Or arterials. And then inside the organ we have capillaries, right? Capillary beds, yeah. These tiny veins, venules, and then they emerge into veins. And the veins carry the blood back, back to the heart. Okay, that's a fine stopping point. Good job, everybody.